Dr. David Hill. I am a professor of medical sciences at Quinnipiac University's Frank H. Schnetter MD School of Medicine in Connecticut. And today I would like to share with you a presentation on COVID-19 and examine where we are with the pandemic and look ahead to the future. So as we begin that, I will screen share. About two months ago, I gave a presentation entitled COVID-19 in Perspective when I compared COVID-19 with previous pandemics, particularly that of swine flu in 2009, and also made comparisons with COVID-19 to two other major uh, outbreaks of coronavirus. One was SARS in 2002-2003, and the other in the ongoing outbreak of MERS primarily in the Middle East. So I would like to update that today, and in particular review the current status of the pandemic present the spectrum of illness with COVID-19 and risk factors for severity, discuss approaches to therapy and prevention, highlight the requirements for reopening our society, and consider the course of the pandemic over the next few months. I started the last presentation with this slide, asking the question, ready? Were we ready for the pandemic? Well, our healthcare personnel were certainly ready to take care of the most uh, critically ill patients, under extremely trying conditions. However, we as a nation uh, had shortfallings, and I think we still do, as, uh, as far as testing is concerned and the ability to uh, identify actually who is infected and be able to trace the contacts of those individuals so that we can isolate them. So it's very difficult to manage a pandemic when we don't know all the individuals who are infected. We certainly are making improvements in that area, which I hope will lead us forward. Let's look first at the epidemiology and transmission. Where does one find data? I think the best uh, sources for data I've listed here, these are ones that I use uh, frequently, to give us information about the status of the pandemic and recommendations. The Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Research Resource Center is the definitive site to look at the progression of the pandemic around the globe. The New York Times has excellent graphics uh, following cases around the United States. Many individuals have looked at uh, modeling for this pandemic. So there are multiple uh, scientific groups that have addressed this. The Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation at the University of Washington, the group that has uh, pioneered the global burden of disease studies, I think has done an excellent job and I've uh, gone to them uh, for information. In order to understand a clear advice about how we progress uh, through the pandemic, both on a national basis and on a global basis. The US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is the definitive resource for the US and the World Health Organization for the global community. This is the site of the Johns Hopkins uh, Coronavirus Re Resource Center. And you can see that it gives the total numbers of cases and then the global deaths associated with these cases. And it breaks it down by each of the countries in the world. If we look at the map in the center, we can see that most of the cases of coronavirus to date have occurred in the global north. But as the disease spreads around the world, that will not always be the case. So recently, a uh, paper has uh, been accepted for publication, which indicates that one fifth of Africa's population will come down with coronavirus over the next several months and a few years. And this will stress an already uh, challenged healthcare system and interfere with efforts uh, to control uh, HIV and TB as uh, global pandemics, to take care of women and children throughout the world, and to pursue vaccine problems. So as we go uh, in the pandemic and maybe things ease in the global north, we need to make sure that we are also taking care of our fellow global citizens in the global south. This is from the New York Times, and it gives a picture of the cases by county in the United States. While the pandemic uh, first was recognized in the Pacific Northwest, in the state of Washington, and then uh, in California, spreading to the Northeast, particularly in the New York metro area, we can now see that there are cases uh, throughout the United States. We can. Uh, zoom in further in terms of how each of our counties can, are doing. Each state will give its own information, but the Johns Hopkins uh, University site does a very nice job giving you a 
county by county uh, report. So this is the report for Nathan County as of the 17th of May. They give you the types of insurance that the citizens in the state will have by age. They break down the state by population, race, ethnicity, so race, ethnicity, and age. They talk about the capacity of the healthcare system in the state, those who are in poverty, the total population, the older population, and then give you information about the caseload, both numbers of cases and the case fatality ratio. So very useful uh, information indeed on a county basis. Let's look at the case fatality rates as of the 17th of May. Globally, there's been a 6.7% case fatality rate in the United States, it's been six. In the United Kingdom and Italy, 14.2. In Germany, 4.5%. China, 5.5. Ecuador, 8.2. And in South Korea, 2.4. So across the globe, there's been a variety in terms of the uh, case fatality. Why is that? Well, the case fatality rate is the number of deaths divided by the number of cases. And cases are confirmed by testing. So if we don't do widespread testing, this number will be smaller, the numbers of cases will be less, and therefore the case fatality rate will be higher. In addition, to date, most of the tests have been done on those who have presented to hospitals, so the most severely ill, and typically these are gonna be the group in which there'll be more deaths. South Korea, at the beginning of the pandemic, had widespread community testing, so they increased the numbers of cases, which partially explains why their case fatality rate has been 2.4. So as we determine the true number who have been infected, the case fatality rate will decrease, so it's likely we're gonna increase this number of cases. However, on the other side, there are also unreported deaths due to COVID. For instance, in New York City, there are 5,300 excess deaths, or 22% more than were reported. So the case fatality rate is uh, clearly going to be quite uh, uh, significant with this and much higher than we're uh, used to with seasonal influenza. We talked in the last presentation about the challenge for not knowing how widely this disease, this uh, virus, has been circulating. And the concept of documented cases, i.e. those that have been uh, received a positive test, and undocument, undocumented COVID infections, either those that might be asymptomatic or those that might be uh, a mild illness not typically seen. So this was uh, the number of documented cases in the United States as of the 1st of March uh, of this year. So these were ones that had been tested, 23 cases as of the 1st of March. However, via mathematical modeling uh, done by uh, scientists at Northeastern University, it was estimated that Boston and Seattle had 2,300 cases, Chicago 3,300 cases, San Francisco 9,300 cases, and New York 10,700 cases. So while we may have known about 23 cases, there were likely thousands of cases that were circulating throughout the United States. And this has been uh, confirmed a bit uh, by understanding that there was a uh, early death uh, in San Jose, California as of the 6th of February, and some zero survey uh, studies looking at antibody prevalence that showed a 21% uh, seropositive rate in New York uh, City, 2.5 to 4.2% in Santa Clara County in California, and 2.8 to 5.6 in LA County. While there have been uh, some questions about the quality of these surveys, I think it does indicate that this virus has been circulating widely in the United States uh, before it was recognized. So, transmission infection questions. I put up these uh, three possible modes of transmission, asymptomatic transmission, pre-symptomatic, and undocumented infection transmission, and really did not have clear answers as to how often these were occurring. I think we have better information now, such that we can say that asymptomatic transmission, so someone who is asymptomatically infected with a virus can transmit it, although the efficiency still is not known. It's likely that if they're not coughing, uh, they're less likely to spread the respiratory droplets uh, that are required for transmission. Pre-symptomatic transmission does occur. It occurs probably one to three days before someone comes down with the typical symptoms. 
And this makes sense because we know that the virus levels uh, in respiratory secretions are highest earliest in disease, unlike that of SARS where they are highest later on in disease. So early on in infection before someone has the full-blown symptoms, they are able to uh, transmit. And this large pool of undocumented infection transmission, individuals who have uh, more mild symptoms perhaps, this is common in terms of transmission. So what about the symptoms and severity of this illness? Well, we started out when we were trying to do uh, surveillance definitions for COVID-19. This is back in early March, the 3rd of March. The CDC put out these. So fever, cough, and shortness of breath being the three major symptoms associated with this. However, as we've gone through the pandemic, we see that there are many more symptoms uh, that can be seen. So this is a study of 180 hospitalized patients uh, in the United States as of uh, the month of March. And most of these, nearly all of these patients, had the classic triad of fever, cough, and shortness of breath. However, frequently they had other symptoms such as myalgias, muscle aches and pains, uh, diarrhea, nausea. So the CDC has expanded the list of symptoms associated with COVID-19 uh, to include these, sputum production, headache, dizziness, may, malaise, uh, rhinorrhea, runny nose, sore throat, and loss of taste and smell. And we're seeing other more unusual manifestations, COVID toe, uh, these uh, discoloration changes in the uh, digits of, of the foot, most likely related to a diffuse uh, vasculitis. And now of concern, an entirely new syndrome, a multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, uh, so far in the United States, there have been uh, more than 120 cases. And in a cohort in the, in the New York City area, 57% of these were ages 5 to 14. And this syndrome is associated with fever, rash, conjunctivitis, or inflammation of the lining of the eyes, myocardial dysfunction, coagulopathy, GI symptoms, and evidence on laboratory testing of increased in inflammatory markers. These cases have been seen around the globe, so it's not just uh, something in the US. And while we considered that children in general had mild illness, I think this is changing the paradigm about how we look at the spectrum of illness across uh, uh, the ages. So we'll have to keep uh, watching for this, and there's been uh, a great deal of effort to uh, more widely recognize uh, this, this uh, syndrome. So in terms of severity, uh, we've known that age, increasing age, increases the severity of infection with COVID. So this is severity uh, based by hospitalization rates in US cases, nearly 1,500 cases in March of 2020. And you can see that 75% of the cases are over the age of 50. So as one ages, there is increasing severity. And with that, there's also increasing comorbid conditions. So older individuals tend to have more complicating medical problems, such as hypertension, obesity, chronic lung disease, diabetes, cardiovascular disease. And in this particular cohort, 90% of those uh, who were admitted to hospital had one or more of the conditions listed here. So not only is age a factor, but if you are, have comorbid conditions, that also increases your risk for severity. In two other studies, one in Georgia and one in the New York City area, most of these patients had uh, multiple medical problems. So 74% were high risk patients in Georgia and 88% had one or more risk factors in the New York City area. So advancing age and chronic medical conditions lead to severity. And then this translates into increased risk of death. Uh, so this is death rates by age in New York City as of the 10th of May. This includes uh, 179,000 individuals. And you can see that the death rate uh, dramatically increases from 45 up through 75 years and older. We've seen this challenge with older individuals and with those with multiple me medical conditions in our nursing homes, in our long-term care facilities. And up to a third of the deaths in the United States have been associated with long-term care facilities, both in the individuals who are working there and in our residents. So it's taken a hu huge toll on that uh, group of, of individuals. 
One of the ways that uh, COVID-19 has uh, raised the veil on some of the inequities that we have in our American society is looking at the disproportionate uh, rate of infection and morbidity and mortality in ethnic minorities. So this is uh, the adjusted rates of confirmed COVID-19 by race and ethnicity in New York City as of the 7th of May. So we can look at case numbers. So this is individuals who are infected but never hospitalized, that they're higher in African-American and Hispanic Latino individuals than in white and Asian Pacific Islanders. There are similar rates, but indeed they are higher in African-American and Hispanic individuals. If we look at the next step of those who are hospitalized, the ethnic minorities are being hospitalized at twice the rate of white and Asian Pacific Islander individuals. And that also plays out in terms of deaths. So why is there this huge discrepancy? Well, there's increased exposure of these individuals through their work, through crowded housing, through comorbid conditions, through less access to healthcare, and to receiving bias, being at the sharp end of bias when seeking health care. So again, as we look to the global south and mitigate the effects of this pandemic there, we also need to look at our most vulnerable in individuals, which are, yes, older, elderly and those with comorbid conditions, but those uh, for whom the, uh, the advantages of our society may not be evenly distributed. Let's now move into treatment and prevention, and the definitive uh, treatment guidelines have been developed by the National Institutes of Health, and these were published uh, as of the 12th of May and are constantly updated. When we think about treatment, we think about primarily trying to uh, treat the consequences of this virus in the lungs, and clearly that is uh, the cause of death in many, many individuals and the cause of morbidity as well. However, this virus has a multiplicity of effects and can affect basically every organ system in the human host. So certainly the lungs are a major focus where you get the virus replicating in the alveolus and a host inflammatory response, which is trying to clear the virus, but in the process is also filling up uh, the alveoli with fluid and cellular debris, causing inflammation such that oxygen is not passing very well from the outside uh, into the uh, blood vessels. So the respiratory symptom very much affected. However, we're also seeing marked effects in the uh, cardiovascular system. So myocarditis in up to 20% of individuals, lots of uh, inflammation in the blood vessels, such as we're seeing uh, clots, the vasculitis uh, that we're seeing perhaps in COVID toe and the multi-system inflammatory disease in children also is related to uh, some of the effects on the cardiovascular sy system. The uh, cerebral, uh, cerebral system as well uh, has been affected through uh, seizures and strokes and confusion. Many people who recover from COVID-19 are left with a, a fairly long lasting confusion and strokes are occurring in young individuals. Other organ systems affected as well. Many individuals are requiring a dialysis, approximately 15%, and whether or not this is the effect of the virus directly on the kidneys or because these individuals are very ill um, and those individuals oftentimes will have uh, kidney problems is not entirely known. So this is a virus that yes, primarily affects the lung, but certainly is affecting other organ systems which make both its uh, management uh, uh, and, and therapy quite difficult. Let's now look at the course of infection. So this is the, the disease course, and we can divide it up into three stages. Stage one, or early infection, stage two, or so-called a pulmonary phase, and stage three, a hyperinflammation phase. So in stage one, in the first week or so of illness, generally people will have mild symptoms, such as fever and cough. They may resolve illness at this point. It might be one of those undocumented infections, or they may progress. They may progress to more uh, severe pulmonary involvement and have shortness of breath without epoxia so that they're able to breathe but not uh, having low oxygen levels or they're short of breath with low block oxygen levels. And then as they progress into this uh, hyperinflammatory space, they have what's called a cytokine release syndrome or a cytokine storm. Uh, two of the uh, cytokines that have been studied have been interleukin-6 and interleukin-1 
with this profound inflammation, so the consequences of both a virus and a, a very aggressive host response to that, individuals can develop acute respiratory distress syndrome as seen in this uh, chest x-ray here. The lungs are completely filled up with fluid, making it very difficult to oxygenate these individuals. They also may have cardiac failure. What's going on with the virus at this point? We've said that the viral titers are highest early on in infection. And as you go through these stages, you have lower viral titers. So you may want to think about antiviral drugs, uh, particularly in the early phase to try and block the replication of virus uh, in, in this early phase. However, antiviral drugs throughout the course of infection would be useful. In this later phase, when you're having this profound host inflammatory response, which is trying to attack this virus, but in the, in the uh, uh, course of that is also affecting uh, the individual in a deleterious fashion, you could consider anti-inflammatory drugs, so trying to modulate the host immune response. So in the NIH treatment guidelines, uh, they have said that there are no food and drug administration approved drugs for the treatment of COVID-19. Although reports have appeared in the medical literature and the lay press claiming successful treatment of patients with COVID-19 with a variety of agents, definitive clinical trial data are needed to identify safe and effective treatments for this disease. So it's not enough just to try lots of things. They have to be tried uh, systematically in a trial so that we understand will this agent benefit the individual or not. The WHO has given similar advice. They recommend researchers around the world to systematically evaluate experimental therapies and randomized controlled trials as a gold standard. Multiple small trials with different methodologies methodologies may not prove enough strong, may not provide enough strong evidence about which treatment will be the most effective. So there are um, uh, multiple trials that are being done throughout the world. This is a real-time uh, COVID uh, uh, collection of trials, so the COVID-19 Living Data Project. 2,367 have been registered as the 15th of May, with 809 of those randomized. And you can see that they are being carried out throughout the world, primarily in the global north, but also some trials in the global south. And they include all types of pharmacologic agents, from animalarial drugs to animalarial drugs plus antibiotics, antibiotics alone, uh, kinase inhibitors, many, many different ones given both singly and in combination. So there are literally hundreds of trials and we need to look at the firm data that results for those in order to make our decisions about which will be most useful in the care of patients. We'll now look at treatments for COVID-19 and particularly at those that have had a good deal of media attention. We'll start with the antivirals. The first one we'll look at is remdesivir. This is an antiviral developed for Ebola virus. It was not effective against Ebola, but now it's being used against COVID-19. Possible mechanisms for its effect are that it inhibits RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, terminates RNA transcription, so essentially terminates viral replication. The NIH has various grades for their recommendations, and for remdesivir, they say yes, it should be used, but reserved for patients with severe disease. The next two agents, chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, chloroquine and antimalarial, and hydroxychloroquine, primarily an anti-inflammatory agent, their purported uh, mechanisms of action are to interfere with virus host cell fusion, and they may have immunomodulatory effects. NIH states that there's insufficient data to recommend for or against using these agents. However, increasing information indicates that in high doses, these have significant cardiac toxicities, and so they use should be very carefully considered. Lopinavir and ritonavir are HIV agents. They're viral protease inhibitors and they should only be used in the context of a clinical trial. If we move to the next group of agents, uh, these are host modifiers and immune-based therapies. Uh, we have drugs that are interfering with those cytokines, such as interleukin-6 and interleukin-1. So tocilizumab and cerilizumab are two agents uh, which are monoclonal antibodies to bind to this to prevent its activity with a goal of modulating that hyperinflammatory immune response. 
NIH uh, says that there's insufficient data to recommend for or against using these agents. And Akinra, an IL-1 receptor antagonist, has the same recommendation. Convalescent plasma, this is taking plasma from individuals who have recovered from COVID-19 and therefore have uh, human antibodies against the virus. So the antibody would be binding to the SARS-CoV-2 virus and preventing it from uh, causing its deleterious effects. The NIH says that there's insufficient data to recommend for or against this. And the use of interferons, which are cytokines, modulating the host response, should only be done in a cl clinical trial. And really, ideally, all of these agents, as I've said, should be done within the context of a clinical trial. Let's focus on remdesivir, who, which, ha which has received Food and Drug Administration emergency use authorization. The data that this was based on was a multi-center trial of, 10, 000, of 1,063 patients with severe COVID, and it was compared against a placebo. In the interim analysis, meaning not the full trial data, there was improved time to recovery, 11 days versus 15 days, and there was a modest mortality benefit, 8% versus 11.6%, which was not statistically significant. So the use of this has been uh, restricted to treating adults and children with COVID-19, documented infection, and severe disease defined as low oxygen saturation, less than 94% on room air, and that requires supplemental oxygen, mechanical ventilation, or extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. And it's given in a five to 10 day treatment intravenously depending upon the severity. What about vaccines? Well, today we got news uh, of the uh, ability of a uh, trial vaccine to stimulate an immune response and to neutralize the virus uh, in an in vitro assay. So there are lots of vaccine candidates that are, out, that are out there. There are more than 85 vaccine candidates. They use different modes to try and stimulate a, a human immune response to the virus. You can take the virus itself, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. You can inactivate it or attenuate it and in, inject that uh, to see if that will develop an immune response. You can take uh, genes of the virus and inject them such that the human host becomes its own little uh, vaccine manufacturing plant so that they are producing viral proteins. And the one that was just uh, uh, discussed in the news today is an RNA vaccine. You can put uh, another, use another virus to introduce uh, SARS-CoV-2 proteins into the human host the, that either replicates or non-replicating uh, virus, so it's a carrier. And you can take viral proteins which, or incomplete parts of the virus and inject those. So protein subunit vaccines and virus-like particles. And this graphic here tells you just how many of these different types of approaches to vaccines are being used. Major questions that we have uh, when looking at vaccination against the virus. Which are the viral antigens responsible for a protective immune response? And are these antigens immunogenic when included in the vaccine? Well, we're having early information about uh, which antigens may be useful and they are immunogenic in a small population. But what is the best delivery system to stimulate this protective immune response? We've just looked at the multiple ways that you can deliver these important antigens. Is the vaccine well tolerated? What's the adverse event profile? So when you give this to a dozen or 50 or 100 patients, you may not be able to determine the wide range of adverse events occurring when you give this to thousands and thousands or millions of individuals. So we need to have a good handle on that. And is it possible that this will lead to a deleterious immune response such that rather than neutralizing antibodies that will be developed in response to the vaccine, there may be enhancing antibodies. So antibodies that will enhance the immune response to infection uh, once the person comes in contact with the COVID virus and perhaps make their illness worse. So these are some of the important considerations. I think one of the most uh, critical ones is, does it protect against COVID-19 in all hosts? It needs to protect the most vulnerable of our society, those who are older, and typically vaccines do not work as well in older individuals, and in those with comorbid conditions. So any vaccine 
that is going to really uh, control this pandemic has to be effective in the young, in the old, and those with uh, chronic medical conditions. And what is the duration of protection? Is this something that would have to be given on an annual basis or would it give individuals long-term immunity? So as, as we look to the future, uh, what are the next steps for reopening? We can see that the curve has flattened on a global basis, it is not on the downslope, it is flatter. Uh, it is certainly decreasing, uh, the cases are decreasing in the European region, but large spikes in the Americas, increased signaling here in Africa, and increased signaling here in Southeast Asia. So while some areas of the world are uh, decreasing in their numbers of cases, other areas of the world are increasing. So there's a dissynchronous uh, uh, approach to this, uh, to this infection. In the United States, we're also having this flattening of the curve and a decline in the numbers of cases and a decline in the numbers of deaths. But it hasn't been as dramatic as in a country such as Germany, where the curve has not come down to zero, but down to very low numbers of daily cases. We are still having uh, thousands of cases each day in the United States. And while the curve overall may be coming down, there is wide discrepancy amongst us uh, in the US. So this is changes in case rates per 10,000 from the previous week. So it's comparing the current week with the previous week. And if you're an area, a county of the United States where there are more cases, you will be pink to reddish. And if you're an area or a county in the United States where there are fewer cases, you will go from the light blue to the darker blue. And although in the Northeast, many areas are uh, increasingly blue, there also are pink and some red areas. And throughout the United States, that is also the case. So as we consider reopening, Yes, we are reopening, but some areas of the United States are having more cases. And how does that work when we have a very mobile uh, society? We may have individuals uh, who are from an area with increasing cases going into an area where there are decreasing cases. So I think that informs the recommendations that we want to give about our reopening. So here's a con uh, competing dynamics. We know that healthcare is overwhelmed during peak COVID demand in terms of personnel, personal protective equipment, the ICU beds, numbers of ventilators, medications that are needed. And during the pandemic, the health system is unable to meet other preventive, elective, and emergent health needs. So we have a death toll associated with the virus itself, but what is the death toll associated with the inability to take care of other chronic or emergent medical conditions? We have a high mortality in vulnerable groups that's the elderly, those with chronic medical conditions. And there's no widely effective antiviral treatment and no vaccine. That contrasts with low morbidity and mortality in many individuals. However, the recognition of new illnesses such as multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children gives us a little bit of pause about the statement that most individuals will not have severe illness with COVID. We certainly need to restart our economy. The effects of that on uh, individuals at risk has been tremendous and help uh, our American citizens get back uh, to gainful employment. And it's very difficult over the long term to adhere to strict social distancing measures. Although I think these are going to be very important as we do more, as we do go forward and reopen our country. What are the requirements of reopening? A reduction in both the documented numbers of cases and those cases that are identified by syndromic surveillance. So if we do not have widespread testing, we need to be using syndromic surveillance, so a compatible clinical syndrome to identify cases. And we generally do that by identifying either influenza-like illness or COVID-19-like illness. And the definitions for these, for instance, influenza-like illness is fever more than 100 degrees associated with cough and or sore throat. A COVID-19 surveillance de definition is two or more fever, chills, rigors, myalgias, headaches, sore throat, taste and smell disorder, or more than one of cough and shortness of breath or severe respiratory illness. So we need to be looking at both documented cases and alert to uh, cases identified by a compatible syndrome. We need to have a reduction in hospitalizations and deaths. Our healthcare system needs to be able to meet patient demands 
not only for those who have COVID, but those who have other illnesses. We need widespread testing to identify infected person, capacity for contact tracing and isolation. And as we reopen, we'll have to continue with uh, hygiene and social distancing measures. I do not see how we can reopen without doing that. Ill persons will still, still need to self-isolate, not going back to spread infection. And always we need to protect the most vulnerable amongst us. So the approach to reopening is a phased approach uh, endorsed by uh, most states and by the uh, US government, CDC, that uses data, ongoing containment and mitigation protection of the most vulnerable, and is left up to states uh, to apply. Generally, this uh, phased opening is assessed in 14-day intervals, taking the maximum incubation period for COVID and seeing if you make an intervention, and then two weeks later, has that resulted in a continually decreased numbers of cases, or are you seeing increased numbers of cases by your actions, and then readjusting your interventions. And you can progress through phases if there's no resurgence in cases. I think it's useful when you're considering opening each of these sectors, such as business, retail, service industry, education, worship, recreation, and travel, by looking at the type of interactions between individuals in each of those settings. So this is taken from the State of Connecticut reopening plan. What is the intensity of contact? So how close are individuals going to be to each other? How long will they be together? How many contacts will they have in this interaction? So if they're gonna be in close proximity for a long period of time with lots of contacts, maybe you wanna alter or delay that type of opening situation. And can you modify that uh, contact intensity through excellent uh, disinfection or cleanly uh, measures and social distancing? So each of these uh, has to be applied to uh, all these sectors before they can be safely reopened. This gets at the issue of testing, which uh, I think has been a challenge uh, for the United States. We can detect the virus and we can detect antibodies to the virus. So this is serology and this is actually testing uh, the virus genetic material or antigens, proteins of the virus. We get a sample from the nasopharynx, from the lung or a sputum sample. And we look for genetic sequences of the virus either by amplifying them through polymerase chain reaction or using a technique called CRISPR, which can identify uh, single uh, parts of the virus. Or we can identify viral antigens, and generally these are rapid point of care tests that can be done uh, with, a, with a quick turnaround time. Detection of antibodies to the virus is called serology. And for all of these tests, whether we're looking at uh, viral detection or serology, we want to have tests that are highly sensitive and highly specific. So sensitivity will detect all infected persons, no false negatives. So everybody who actually has the virus will be identified. Specificity looks at the other side. That will not detect uninfected persons so that there won't be anybody who's a false positive. So all those who are not infected will not be called uh, actually infected. So let's look at an example of this. If we have a 5% prevalence of COVID in the community, so five cases per 100 people and a test with 96, so that's very high sensitivity and specificity, even this high, highly specific test for the positive test will be false positives. So we will identify individuals as having the virus who actually do not have the virus. So we also have to have the capacity to retest individuals in certain circumstances if they test positive. We also need to know what is our capacity for access to testing. Is it widely available? Who is eligible to be screened? Can we scale up to do the numbers that we need? What is the cost of doing this? Do we have enough reagents? It's uh, predicted through a modeling that we need 500,000 to 2.5 million tests a day to be able to get a better handle on this pandemic. In, uh, over the last 10 days, we've had an average of around 317. So we are approaching that 500,000 mark, but that's actually the minimum that we need. And once we identify all those who are positive, we need thousands of individuals to follow up on positive tests for contact tracing. So a robust uh, uh, test that can identify infected individuals and the capacity to follow up on their contacts. 
What about antibody testing? There's been a lot in the news uh, about that. Unfortunately, these tests are poorly validated. And does a positive test indicate past infection, current infection or past infection? Or does it also indicate immunity? So if you have a positive antibody, does that just say you had the disease? But does it also say you are now protected from infection? And is a positive test specific for infection with SARS-CoV-2? Or are there cross-reactivity with one or more of the other common cold seasonal beta coronaviruses? So is this kind of like a false positive test where you think you're protected, but you're not really protected because you're reacting to another type of coronavirus? The WHO uh, at the end of April recommended not using antibody tests as proof of protection as SARS-CoV-2. And the FDA has been concerned enough about these so that they've asked all manufacturers to submit their requests with validation data within 10 business days. So they sent that out on the 4th of May. So now they should be getting back all the uh, important data that can allow the FDA to analyze the quality of these tests. There's no doubt that the quality of antibody testing for this virus will improve over time. And I am sure that this will become a useful uh, a tool in understanding who has been infected and who might be protected, but I don't think as of the middle of May uh, that we can use this. So right now we have a fairly uh, a difficult way of doing this. We generally have to do a nasopharyngeal a swab uh, and, and bag it and send it off to a lab to have it run. There are uh, faster tests, uh, but we hope that we can get to the point where you can do a test, let's say at home, like a home pregnancy test where you put in uh, your sample here in the well and put in a buffer and you see whether or not you have uh, the line here which indicates that you have SARS. So we certainly would like to move to this so that we have wide uh, availability of testing which can be done by individuals. So finally, what does the, uh, uh, the future look like, at least in the near term? These are assumptions that I've put together. Uh, we're not gonna see this virus reintroduced from an animal reservoir, it will only be from humans. Yes, this came from an animal, but this is not how it's being spread currently. So this is a, a human, primarily a human only virus. There's not gonna be long-term, let's say more than two week, asymptomatic or recovered carriage of the virus. So those who, are, um, who have had the virus will clear it. And there's currently no herd or population immunity. This has been a, uh, a, a fiercely debated topic. I think we have probably five to 10 percent of individuals who have been infected. That would vary depending on where they are in the country. Some rural areas of the United States may have very few people infected. Some urban areas, such as in New York City, it probably is around five to 10 percent. And if we base uh, a reproductive ratio around 2.5, so that means that for every person infected, they will infect two and a half other individuals, we need herd immunity of 60%. So for us to achieve herd immunity of 60%, the fallout uh, would be, uh, I think, catastrophic. Uh, we would overwhelm our uh, healthcare system again. And in the process, there would be far more deaths uh, than we are currently uh, having. And now with the challenge of our uh, multi-system inflammatory syndrome in, in children, this is not a group that would, uh, could, could get COVID virus and not uh, see some deleterious effects of it. So I do not see that a widespread, uh, allowing widespread transmission of this virus is helpful. The way we need to get our 60% uh, herd immunity is through vaccination, not through natural infection. Another assumption is that SARS-CoV-2 uh, does not have mutations that confer enhanced virulence or the ability to readily reinfect as with influenza. There's good data now that says that mutations are not occurring uh, to confer uh, increased virulence. We need to continue with social distancing and measures. We need the capacity for widespread testing, tracing, and isolating. And we need to consistently lower our reproductive ratio less than one so cases will subside. The WHO in April uh, gave three scenarios of the progression of this, uh, of this pandemic, complete interruption of human to human transmission, recurring epidemic waves, large or small, or continuous low level transmission. 
well, I don't think we're going to have complete interruption of human to human transmission until we have an effective vaccine. We are having recurring epidemic waves. In fact, we're having just one large wave now. Perhaps countries and regions that have been able to lower the numbers of cases will have recurrences. Uh, but right now, there seems to be continuous and I would say uh, uh, fairly high level transmission in many areas. And until we have a broadly effective vaccine for global administration, so it has to be broadly effective in all hosts and available to all citizens of our world, we will have continuous transmission. If we look at the uh, projected daily deaths from the Institute of Health Metrics at the University of Washington, uh, this is their projection as of uh, the 12th of May. They predict that the total numbers of deaths by August may be 147,000 with a range of 113 to 227,000. As of uh, the 18th of May today, we've had nearly 90,000 deaths. Are we willing as a society to continue to have tens of thousands of deaths as we try and control this pandemic? We do not have to have that kind of uh, mortality and morbidity and burden on our health care system and on our economy. We can avoid these types of, of mortality data. If we open up too widely, this, these kinds of predictions will come, will come to pass and we will have thousands of, of I say, needless deaths. So we need to balance our personal and economic freedom with a public good or really with a healthy public. And we need to continue aggressive containment and mitigation efforts through surveillance, testing, contact tracing, isolation, and social distancing until we have a vaccine which can be given to all citizens of our country and throughout the globe. I would like to close uh, with Two items, uh, placing again COVID in perspective. One is uh, this past week was the 40th anniversary of the eradication of another uh, pandemic, a worldwide scourge, a scourge which had been in the United, in, throughout the world for at least 3,000 years and killed 300 million people in the 20th century alone. This was eradicated. Smallpox is our only infectious disease that has been eradicated through a concerted global eradication effort from 1967 through 1977 that relied upon classic public health control measures and the smallpox vaccine. So we will need a vaccine against COVID-19 in order to control this disease. Finally, I'd like to quote from the uh, speech that Tedros Ghebreyesus, the Director General of the WHO, gave on the 11th of March in 2020. There's so much, been so much attention on one word, pandemic, but let me give you some other words that matter much more and are that much more actionable. Prevention, preparedness, public health, political leadership, and most of all, people. We are in this together to do the right things with calm and protect the citizens of the world. It's doable. So I thank you for your attention and encourage everyone to continue the sensible, sensible public health measures to control COVID-19. Thank you.